So welcome. It's wonderful to be chatting with everybody here today. And thanks so much for joining. There's some more people just busting in as they come. But as I said, we're recording the session. It's a funny time. Uh, it's an it's a awkward time to get the US, Australia, uh, uh, people in India, Mauritius, uh, South Africa. So it's, it's uh, very difficult to get this audience together. So it's 6 a.m. here for me, and I've got a coffee in hand, and I had a relatively late night. Um, so please bear with me as we, we try and navigate this very interesting topic. And we, we probably won't go around the room and, and just do introductions because we've got too short a time. Um, but we'll do that as we, as we speak to our guests who have joined us today. Uh, Rob, Paul, Stephen, thanks so much for, for making the time. Unfortunately, uh, Seema's got uh, some personal family matters uh, to attend to, which is prohibiting her from being here today, unfortunately. But um, very happy to have Robin Paul in particular. Stephen, not so much. Um, he's a personal a friend of mine, so I can't abuse him. Um, but we'll we'll kick off with with Robin Paul. Um, just a brief introduction as as to who you are. And we're speaking today about the business of education. And one of the questions I I pose to them is. How necessary or is it necessary at this particular juncture in our history to be calling uh, the higher education sector a business and to be considering it as a business? So I'm just going to um, uh, get your initial take on it, and then we can dive into some more detail a little bit later. So I'll, I'll hand over to Rob, who's got a bigger smile than Paul at the moment. So I'll let, <laughs> I'll let him do uh, the starting um, conversation. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's good to meet you guys. Um, my name is Rob Westervelt, and currently I'm in St. Louis. I just moved here from Oregon uh, eight months ago. So I am the I currently serve as the vice president for strategy and innovation. So this I'm smiling so big because this is something uh, I've been in higher education for 23 years, and this is the the B word. It used to be when I first started out, it was brand was the bad word, but now it's business is the bad word. And so what I would do is I would always take a picture of our business license in our finance office and add it to one of my presentations. Uh, just to remind people that we are a business, we have customers and they pay us for what we do. And as such, we always have to be mindful of anticipating the needs and expectations of our customers. And I think it's more acute now than ever. Uh, and you see this emerging, all these emerging companies outside of traditional higher education that are fulfilling needs that higher education has not. So I think they're pushing the envelope a bit on the business side to remind us, you know, we need to be innovative, we need to be changing, and we need to be thinking about our customers. So uh, I think it's imperative that we see ourselves as a business. It's a great introduction and, and very provocative. I'm, I'm sure Paul will tap that though. Let's, let's see. <laughs> Hello, good morning or afternoon for you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon. And I just finished my coffee, so I don't know what that says about me. I'm ready to go. Uh, it was Paul too Mark, big, I'm, Paul. That, that was probably the <laughs> problem. I've, I've, I, have had, I had a little espresso, so I need that. <laughs> Um, Paul, Mark, I, I spent 32 years at Stanford University, retired in October of 2020 uh, as Associate Vice Provost, and my job was really to bridge Stanford and industry, and so um, as soon as you start uh, thinking about doing that, you're talking to customers about uh, students as, as customers and, and, and engagement around that, so I currently serve as uh, uh, Principal of Parallax Global Advisors, and I'm helping people think through how and what to do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, education strategy. And I'll share a quick story. I had a meeting with um, a provost at a, an R1 university. And to Rob's point, the business uh, third-party providers are swirling around this university and they're seeking opportunities and picking off faculty and units left and right. And they don't really know how to react or respond. To, for the longest time, the university has been about uh, a social mission really to provide education. And, and it's really a sort of a, a do good uh, print and, and it has served, uh, I think, uh, many communities very, very well. I think the opportunity now is to move from a faculty focused activity to a student focused customer centric activity. 
And I think that's the opportunity. And universities need to um, embrace that to some extent, to understand it, and to, to take baby steps toward uh, extending and expanding that kind of vision, moving from faculty-centric to student and or customer-centric. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Stephen, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. And just to try and get your thoughts on, on the topic, Stephen is also one of the, or if not the leading writer on module three. And so he's the author of, of all the content or the vast majority of content um, that you're going to be reading. Um, so Stephen, I'm gonna hand over to you and, and just to give me your, your thoughts on, on the topic and just a brief bio. Cool. Thanks, Warren. I'm glad to see I'm not just here to make up numbers <laughs> and I, I will get a chance to speak. Thank you. Kind, kind of you. Uh, evening, everyone from Joburg, South Africa. Uh, I, unlike everyone else having coffee to wake up, I'm about ready to turn in for the evening. So I'll try to be as sharp a pencil as I can be. Uh, thanks also, Warren, for setting me up. If anyone's unhappy with module three, you obviously know where to steer your, your complaints and aggravation. Uh, certainly, I agree with the, the two gents and, and my colleagues. You know, I, I'm certainly a proponent of viewing, at least in certain measures and certain dimensions, higher education as a business. I think the thing I'd like to put forward is this isn't simply about the... Uh, I, I was watching a documentary yesterday and they referred to private higher education as predatory marketers, and I, th I thought that was quite harsh. Um, and I, I do know that the word business and uh, higher education are not exactly synonymous. And it, 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 I think we even refer to it that some people may feel it's heresy. But I think the issue is in a world of scarce resources, there's a dire need to start looking at the um, resources under education's charge and to optimize them. I think what we've seen is runaway expenses associated with higher education, which is really in essence a necessity to be competitive in, in the job market. Everyone is aspiring and clamoring to get into the, into the institutions. And I think some of the funding and some of the resources and some of the decisions that have been taken have not been in the best interests of the stakeholders and, and had more rigorous business models been applied, decisions might've been different. And I think outside of the profit motive of a business, the notion of optimization of resources and the maximization of value for the stakeholders is the key aspect and attribute of kind of business thinking that we'd like to see ported across into higher education. Uh, championing innovation, championing the notion of um, maximizing value and output and return on investment in, in all its forms, not just the financial investment, and absolutely seeking to minimize any wastage within the system. And those are kind of some of the dimensions of, of the business philosophy that I would like to see ported across um, to higher education. So certainly a, a proponent of it from, from that respect. Great, uh, thanks so much for the opening kind of um, setting the scene as it were. I'm gonna pick on some people. So I'll pick on Augustine or Valerie in this particular instance to just uh, give your initial reaction to what's been said thus far and whether you're in agreement uh, with the general notion or whether we've got to think about this in a slightly different way. Um, so I'll start with Augustine first. Thank you, Warren. Uh, great, uh, absolutely, I agree totally with, uh, with the three of you. Uh, but I would like to ask a question. Uh, and this is a question that I would pose to you as well. Um, so right now in the United States, we're in a bit of a we're in a bit of a challenging time, right? So we have experienced over the last maybe 30, 40 years the largest increment in tuition uh, that has essentially gone up more than in salaries, inflation, uh, you name it. We have been the the, the greatest increment of costs uh, in higher education in anywhere in the world. Uh, but this is also coupled with the fact that today. Obviously the model is evolving. So the business model of education and higher education is under fire. So how do you, how do you believe, uh, and this is a question I would ask the three of you to look at, where, where do you see the challenge between this new ROI that we have? In other words, the fact that kids can't keep affording to pay these exorbitant amounts in tuition versus the changing business model and the way education is being delivered today. 
Okay, we, we've only got like half an hour, Augustine, but thanks for your- Can we, can, uh, can we, all right, there we go. Um, but yeah, I throw yeah. out the question. <laughs> Paul, let's hear from you. Let's, let's hear what you have to say. I, I think, uh, yeah, costs are increasing and under constraint, how do you serve? Um, I, I think really requires uh, some unique and different thinking. The unit that I worked, the Stanford Center for Professional Development was a tub on its own bottom. And the way that I thought about it was we can provide uh, content to a, a variety of different offerings, including MOOCs to provide value at, at variable pricing. And I think, so th th as you start to think about the model, the model needs to evolve. It can't just be tuition for some discrete number of students paying a, a certain price and then sort of funding others re research and, and the like. So I, I think there are, there are so many places that there are, where there are opportunities to change and adjust the model. But I think we, the, the key, uh, the key uh, word that comes to my mind is experimentation around external business units like SCPD, where we were adjacent to the university, leveraging that content, um, piloting uh, new programs to extend and expand um, to the lifelong learning market where there's enormous opportunity and third parties are already starting to, to target that and, and start to drive some change back into the institution through those methods. Great, yeah. thanks. Rob? Yeah, I think, I mean, what a great question. You know, it's interesting because we think about uh, tuition as being exorbitant. It is for certain people and not for other people. And that's relative to what is the outcome. So like you don't hear engineers complaining about tuition as much as you hear uh, maybe an English major uh, complaining about tuition. In, in some majors, you could say, well, tell me when this costs too much, right? Now others, it's like, you're already past the point. But then you go back to your uh, infrastructure and you say, do we really need all this stuff? Like, look at the, how many programs are there per university? And there are different kinds of universities, right? Stanford has different capabilities than Lindenwood does. But when you look at the uh, offerings, students have to pay for the whole thing. And so you've got, you know, a hundred programs. Do you need a hundred? And where are the cost savings for the student? But again, that goes back to what Steven said earlier about ROI and looking at ROI from the perspective of the different student groups. But um, Paul mentioned variable pricing. Most schools aren't doing variable pricing. They're charging a flat rate for everybody and everybody has to pay all the ongoing costs for every single program. And that just doesn't make sense. And it, and it doesn't make sense from a business perspective. It makes sense from an educational perspective. And that, I think this is where the dichotomy is because you can make a case for the education being provided but the business case is a different case. And I think that's where the conversation needs to be had. Well, I think they summed that up very nicely, Augustine, to your lengthy question, and they'll write a book <laughs> afterwards and a white paper to summarize their, their thinking. Um, but we've had it. We've had it. It just yeah. goes to prove that they can do 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't take forever. Absolutely. Uh, Tina, you had a question that I would probably like to direct to Stephen. I saw you send something through. Just articulate your thoughts there. Yeah, connected to um, some of the questions also in the previous modules already around um, how we can scale without losing quality, but also I would say without increasing costs. Um, as usually, um, although in business, if we talk about economies of scale, costs go down in business, in schools, it seems that costs go up. Let this be due to inefficiencies or let this do to be okay, plan B is we'll just increase tuition fees. Who knows what the business model uh, is that the CFOs are there cooking up. But um, yeah, it's just kind of connected to that um, in regards to, I think, this entire conversation. Um, yeah, just thoughts on this. Um, I was basically making a comment on on trying to connect the two previous module, I think, um, aspect. Yeah, no, thanks for doing that. Um, that was my job, but appreciate that you're doing it better. Thank you, Tino. You've been um, delightful in the program as well. You've really been um, giving us a lot of food for thought. So thanks for your contribution. Stephen, I'll handball that one over to you just to give some initial thoughts too. Yeah, look, I think I'm going to be a bit sneaky and kind of link it back to uh, Augustine's question. So I think th those two questions combined are, in, in some respects, in my view, sort of the two sides to the same coin. And I have a similar answer in some respects. You know, obviously, um, 
reducing costs and delivering quality and doing it at scale um, and, and, and making the entire process accessible to the most possible people is really the holy grail of, of higher education at the moment. How can we massify this social good and get people access? And I think a, a lot of the things that have been mentioned, you know, the variable pricing and the rationalization of the curricula are absolutely critical. I would simply take that a step further. And the word that springs to mind, uh, obviously with the time we have that would encompass my thinking is disintermediation. And what I mean by that is kind of a service unbundling. What you get in higher education is someone like the engineers, to use Rob's example, probably aren't complaining because they have a high capital cost often in, associated with those programs because of machinery, equipment, uh, the nature of the program and things they need access to, where someone in the arts may not have as a, a sort of heavy requirement or cost burden for the university. So those students often are subsidizing uh, students in the sciences or in, 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 in disciplines that require labs and equipment and things of that nature. Similarly, uh, you've got things where people are paying for the upkeep of soccer stadiums, football stadiums, uh, athletic fields, all sorts of infrastructure that may be superfluous and never tapped into by the vast majority of students. So to sort of circle back, um, in order to deliver the quality at scale, what you want is that people are afforded a tiered payment structure that allows them to extract uh, the value that they require out of the learning ecosystem with the minimum subsidy of other people. So you have mm. pricing that is structured towards people and tailored towards people based on their needs. If I'm going to be someone who partakes in a raft of sports and extracurricular activities, if I'm going to be someone who's going to need equipment and all sorts of things of that nature, then I should be charged potentially a different fee structure. Similarly, if I'm going to learn online and I'm in one of the classes that lends itself to the massification of a MOOC style classroom environment, I should be naturally paid a lot less. And I think through that rationalization of the unbundling of the service basket of higher education, you can scale it in different ways and apportion finances in a more readily appropriate way. And the irony might be where you could scale classes with high volumes of students in, in the types of disciplines that lend themselves to that. By definition, you're going to leverage the benefit of economies of scale, and then you might be able to cross subsidize some of those other facilities. But I think there's this need for a rationalization of the entire service offering of higher education, possibly uh, ultimately looking at nuances and niche brands that service different people in different ways based on bundles of requirements of service that they potentially mm. need. But essentially, it would be a, a disintermediation um, of, the, of the higher education service basket. Paul. Yeah, so I'm going to leapfrog Stephen's idea as he did uh, to, to mine. The thinking is that it's really a lifelong learning journey. It's you know, so rather than a four, eight year frame, you need to start thinking 60 year frame. And what if you could create a subscription model for the obsolescence of every one of us in this uh, little uh, sort of uh, three by four box, right? Uh, the idea is that um, alumni graduate in the first ask for many universities in the U.S., as Augustine knows, is uh, you know, how can you give back? Well, how can the university actually provide value for the give back? I, I think sort of thinking about, thinking in novel ways about that 60 year time horizon. I note that Valerie cleverly escaped uh, the question, but it also works for the, for the D Division of Continuing Ed, something near and dear to my heart. And, and I think that's where lots and lots of opportunity and flexibility exist in thinking about, uh, you know, the potential sort of future state model. Mm. Good. So I'll put Valerie back on the spot then. As far as any any questions, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna close us out um, with with a, a difficult one for for the gents. But is there anything that you wanted to add to the conversation at this point, Valerie? Um, I think a, a question actually um, talking about optimizing. I mean, I think in at least our institution, I find a lot of the staff lack the business skills mm. to get us there. Uh, and in seeking out training, a lot of the training that's out there is meant for people in business. It's not meant for people within our context. So um, I'm just curious for those of you out there, you know, if you've found programs or different ways that you can, we could upskill our own people to get there because I think that we're having a hard time trying to find a way to apply that to our, our circumstances. 
Yeah, well, watch this space. We're desperately trying to navigate there very soon. So uh, I'll keep that in. I'll keep that in mind. But thank you for reinforcing my my value proposition there. That um, I'm sure Stephen is is nodding. Clinton, Ciara, we haven't heard from you. Uh, Clinton, let's let's start with you. What what do you want to add here? No. I, I, I was wanting to pick up on a point. Um, Paul, you mentioned the term experimentation, and I, I, I'm intrigued um, by the, the, the way what you did at Stanford was separate from the main institution and, and having forums through, you know, the university, certainly the university I'm in, is, is, is structured and has lots of impediments for experimentation, even though people might be willing to, to, to do it. There's a lot of standardized processes and, you know, committees and so on. Um, the, the, the notion that you would set up a separate entity that might be less constrained and, and incubate. Could, could, I would just, we certainly don't have that. Um, and I, I was curious about your, your experience in maybe that sort of space at at Stanford and your, and, uh, you know, gen your general reflections on the way that operated and, and the way that it fit together with, I would say, a, you know, a fairly bureaucratic university, at least in my experience on, on one level. So, so uh, a lot of, I'm going to try to keep this really tight given the timing, uh, a lot of coffees and lunches with faculty who will make a difference, right? I and mean, so influential faculty, get them to adopt and address the opportunities. So you as an administrator may have air cover uh, to try things. I, I think that's that's what we found. And uh, the one example, we built the first um, third party content collaboration with a group called uh, IPS Learning, a very small consultancy in project management. We worked with the civil and fac environmental faculty, tenure line faculty, Ray Levitt, to build this program that ran for 20 years, where we piloted not only a non credit online blended certificate, but also um, created a, a movement in the advanced project management space. So it can just, this started with one faculty member teaching project management. That's all we had. And we were able to around that stitch some lots and lots of new business model revenue sharing with an outside partner it was so just you just need a little bit of air cover <laughs> yeah which is the the first challenge for you Clinton but you and your team are doing stellar work so I have no doubt that you'll you'll make that uh, a reality very, very soon or you can speak to ourselves to see how you can extend that afterward. Um, uh, Ciara, I'm just going to lean on you for, for one final question before I wrap up with the, the, the guests. For sure. Hopefully it's not too big of one, but um, you could make it short or maybe just brainstorm an idea. When we were talking about like Stephen or I think Paul, you were as well, but unbundling and kind of the pathway there. I guess my question is, if you have any ideas or thoughts when you're trying to bridge or stopgap that when programs have been subsidizing another, or especially for diversity and inclusion, when some students maybe aren't able to hit a higher price point, I guess, where do the funds come from in the interim? Is it industry? Is it like nonprofit groups? Or how do you get from our current financial situation to the process of, of bridging to subscription model or bridging to new models? I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or proposals for that. Steven? Yeah, again, I think that's a fantastic question. And, and the answer is no, not any clear sort of structured ways of doing it. I think the, the reason for that is so many of the institutions um, have such unique structures. I mean, here in South Africa, we're dealing with a heavily funded public sector. Um, but in, in their case, technically, they have war chests that would allow them to bridge and self-fund gaps should they so choose to do it. So that, that would be an enabling aspect for them. Uh, obviously, that could also be cross-subsidized by incre increased volumes of online learning if they chose to stay with that. On the other hand here, we have a, a large contingent of private higher education, technically for profit. And I think in their uh, instance, it's, it's far harder because their model is heavily reliant to the tune of 100% on student fees. Um, and they do rely to a large extent on cross-funding in some respects. However, that's also offset by the fact that they don't tend to uh, offer the, the technical disciplines. They tend to stay with uh, the education, humanities, uh, law, psychology, things of that nature, which technically have a low capital burden outside of the classroom and facilitator. 
So I think with uh, with the, their environment, what would be required is either injecting uh, private funding, uh, so literally bridging funding, something of that nature, or again, trying to scale rapidly uh, options that would lend themselves to online and MOOC style delivery, as well as maybe more innovative uh, pay for badge. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the subscription model of education for lifelong learning, as opposed to having a, a client for three years, have a client for 60 years, and obviously morph uh, in certain modules or through alumni, draw them back to through bringing in a new client base that previously wouldn't have been subscribers, but also wouldn't be taxing the infrastructure, cross fund through alumni, new first years and second years and third years moving through the system. But that, that would obviously take quite a lot of financial engineering to make sure that those numbers stack up. But kind of off the cuff, that's where my, my thinking would gravitate. <clears throat> I, I'm very conscious of time. I kept these sessions purposefully for, for half an hour in respect of mainly uh, Paul Rob Stevens' time and, and also, of course, all, all participants' time. Uh, anyone can peel off at any stage. I uh, appreciate that we've all got uh, pressing schedules and so on, but what I'll do is I'll just hand over to Rob and Paul in particular just to uh, give any parting thoughts on on the topic at hand. In particular, we know why it's important. I, I think that's um, been well stated, well understood, well said. Um, how do we do it? And and this has been part of the conversation around Clinton Ciara's comments, Augustine's comments, but um, in particular about how do we start engineering the kind of change that we want to see uh, when we consider higher education as a business and where, where we would start, what are the most important things that, that we would kind of start with. And so I'll, I'll handball that over to Rob because he hasn't spoken for a while. Um, and then, as I said, feel free to peel off. Um, uh, absolutely no need to say goodbye or anything, just, just drop off. Rob. Yeah, I, I think when we look at our systems, we have to ask the design principles behind them and say, who is this system designed for? And if you look at where we're sort of ending in this cycle and you look at the Higher Education Act and how all this is getting funded, right, through these loans and the apparatus that was built over the last 40 or 50 years in particular, if you were to ask your, you know, at your own institution and say, who is this system built for? you will never find the person it's built for because it's not built for anyone. It's built on exceptions. And the only way out, there's no training that can get you through this problem. What, what, what is needed is courage. I mean, if we all looked at our institutions, we could all say, we know exactly what needs to be changed. And then the question is, why isn't it changed? Uh, because the leaders lack the courage to change it. And then all of a sudden people do something courageous. Like I, I, when you guys were talking, I was thinking of Georgia Tech because uh, it was Tino that asked the question related to scalability of high quality. Well, they did that, right? I mean, that now look at their master's in computer science. Their whole goal was a high quality computer, master's in computer science at one eighth the cost. And they did it. And now 71% of all their graduate students are online. Most people don't even know that, but they did it through partnerships. They did it by using things like MOOCs, right? Which are like, for some people in higher ed, MOOCs are anathema. And they're like, oh, MOOCs totally failed. No, they didn't. MOOCs were wildly successful. You know, by the way, it's only been 10 years since the first MOOC at Stanford, right? And so, uh, so anyway, I think one of the big questions is how do we create a new system? And that's where you see these third parties who are doing that from the ground up. It's like Amazon built its system and then it brought people into it. Uh, we didn't do that. We kind of cobbled together things and sprinkled technology on top of it and then tried to say, how do we scale this? You can't, right? <laughs> you can't unless you own something in a brand space that warrants the price of admission. In most schools, it's just not possible. Yeah, thank you. So Rob, 
if you need to peel off, please jump off. Um, uh, Rob's one of the, the smartest people I know. So um, either I've got to improve my network or um, or he really is that smart. Um, but please, <laughs> you need to improve your network. <laughs> <laughs> but, but please, please follow his work. Um, uh, follow him on LinkedIn. He's, he's been um, covering off a couple of speaking engagements at the moment. And so please just um, pay attention to what he's up to. Um, Paul, I'll hand over to you. I mean, I, I, I love Rob's perspective, and I would just add that, oh, by the way, you have faculty who are not trained to run institutions, running the institutions, and, you know, then there's turnover every five years because they want to go back to doing teaching and research. So I think that there's an, it's, it's absolutely critical that I think Valerie's point that we start to train people, administrators, uh, to help provide a management layer that might make sense of these wacky, crazy institutions or, or, which were designed by exception handling as opposed to um, by, by f f sort of design. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it's, look, it's, it's a really interesting time and there's enormous opportunity there. Uh, now in, in my work as a consultant, I'm able to sort of get a glimpse about what other universities are thinking and doing. And it's, it, is, it is truly uh, a, a change that, is, that will occur and we will, I think, never go back for the very reasons, Rob, that you mentioned. The technology is enabling content to become ubiquitous. I think it has also uh, created a responsibility for universities to think about what on earth they're doing to create a sense of community not only for those people who are in residence, but those who are away from the campus and then expanding the definition of what it means to be a student. And so I, I think that the, the, this, this change, we're not going back. We're not going to the sort of safe and sane community. I think uh, we need to expand that definition and, and this will create uh, another potential layer of, um, of challenge on top of the, the poor design. So how can we take a step back and think about these structures and opportunities, think about it more like a business and train people to, to, to match that, uh, that significant challenge that I think we have ahead of us. Thank you, Paul. Uh, really enjoyed that summary. And um, I'm going to just hand over to Stephen um, just for closing comments. And then if there are any other questions and anyone wants to continue, please. Please shout them out. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, I think, look, it's, it's such a rich, diverse and, and emotive topic, this, this notion. You know, I've, I've had a background as an academic and um, far longer as a, as a commercially sort of driven person talking about literally with all my clients as a management consultant and as a strategist and, and previously as a, a marketing exec about the business of education. And I think one of the things that clouds this, it's, it's actually just, it, it's probably fresh in my mind. I've literally just finished uh, the book by Jeff Booth, The Price of Tomorrow, where he talks about, um, again, abundance and, and that we're going into an abundant uh, era and that that's going to have huge deflationary impacts on, on the world. And I think that's, that's we've spoken about it in the, in the last group we ran, where there's an artificial sort of facade and barrier that higher education creates, institutions the elites, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, whoever you want to pick, um, where the prestige is absolutely predicated on scarcity and the scarcity equals the employability. Now, as a social good, if everyone was to receive a Harvard or a Stanford education, we could probably all agree that the balance of the average of society's intelligence and ability to contribute would go up. But unlike a conventional business model where they would do everything in their power to accommodate that excess demand, it's in their interests to rationalize it because the prestige and the elite nature of that institution is what gets the people who can afford it to gravitate toward them and they are allowed to and can operate that on a very small and rationalized scale, which is the complete antithesis of kind of a massification business model where you would want to create a monopoly and gain all of that clientele. And I think that, that that's one of the challenges that education faces. If we could make it at almost zero cost, what would that mean? And how in an abundant world where we can deliver it at scale with high quality, as Rob says, with proven models, um, how should we do that? And then what might a totally new business model look like? And I think those are the kind of uh, things we need to grapple with. In an abundant society, in a deflationary potential society, what might the business and operating model for education then look like? Mm. Yeah, really, 
Great point, Stephen. Um, uh, Robin, Paul, please, I, I am very serious when I say please peel off um, as required because uh, I'm I, I just don't want to. Um, it's too like interesting. That. It's too interesting. <laughs> I can't. I can't stop. We're all waiting to hear what one another says because yeah. we don't have these yeah. frequently enough. I'm always keen to listen to the gents. I mean, yeah. what you, did, yeah. what you said too. though, Stephen. I, I was thinking. I'm trying. I'm, there's a couple of things that you said that I'm wondering about because um, you know one of the primary functions of universities is to filter people originally, right? Because there's just too many people. Absolutely and employers need to hire them. So like one of the problems with higher education is that they're, they're doing a worse and worse job of filtering people out. So as more people get degrees and more universities copy each other, the filter looks the same. It has the same deficiencies because one thing that higher ed's really good at is rapidly copying, right? But then it rapidly copies all the garbage. And then you get all these people are trying to hire people going, you know what the problem is? You all have the same deficiencies and I'm getting really tired of it. And then these other people come and say, well, I got a better filter. And so, um, but again, it goes back to stepping way back and saying, what are we doing here? And that's where the business model comes in is there's just not agreement on what we're doing uh, in each of our institutions sometimes. And the ones who get clarity on what they're actually doing, they're having a lot of success. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think this business model or conversation is so important because it says, what are we in the business of actually doing? And um, and so that's just a really that's why I can't leave this conversation because I keep hearing this stuff and I'm like, I want to hear more. I'm taking notes myself. So <laughs> no, well, I, I, if, I, if, I, if I could offer a comment here. Um, so let me let me suggest this. Uh, a couple of months ago, I was uh, a chancellor at a, a Latin American university in Buenos Aires. And so one of the decisions that was made at the time was to reduce the level of research that we were doing in favor of expanding our geographic availability of professors uh, to attend to underserved communities using online learning across the country. Uh, we were triple digit growth in terms of enrollment. So, I mean, even in 2020, uh, we, were, we did 147% in new enrollment. But what this, this came at the cost of literally saying we're not going to invest as much in research because we can't have professors researching teaching online uh and, and on top of that growing at triple digits this was a conscious uh, uh decision and of course it was met with all sorts of people uh who were absolutely against the notion because they insisted that as a research university we should be paying attention to research uh but obviously we did this knowing that we would grow and this is a trade-off. So there is a trade-off here. Mm. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's a fantastic point. So the university that I, I was uh, both a student and lecturer at uh, here in South Africa had the same dilemma. They, they set target quotas where as a research institute, they wanted a 60-40 split between postgrad and undergrad. So definitely focusing on publish, uh, creation of new knowledge, research, scientific endeavor. I think the, the, this to me in some way, and I, yeah, it's such a complex discussion, but speaks to what I was alluding to with some of the unbundling and the niching. There is opportunity across the university landscape for all of that white space to be filled for institutions to become specialist in those areas. And I think if certain institutions were bold enough to commit to what is our core purpose within the spectrum that is the service offering of higher ed, that would mm. allow for uh, different almost verticals and, 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 and different positionings of institutions to take occupancy. And for instance, what, what that institution that I'm talking about was Wits University uh, in Joburg. And what they tried to do to offset certain of the reliance on subsidies by not having uh, such large numbers of undergrad students at the time was to look at an enterprise model that would translate the research and ultimately service uh, job creation and the commercial market by either patenting or taking IP and licensing it or, or translating certain of those discoveries and innovations into actual business models. Um, mm -hmm. They were not necessarily hugely successful in that, but I think the, that model and that concept, particularly here in South Africa, was too embryonic. But this mm -hmm. notion of potentially creating accelerators 
particularly in a country like ours where we need job creation. I'm actually involved with a, a gentleman now on a project where we're looking at trying to do that. Can we raise seed capital to fund academics and students and their innovations to create employers rather than employees? There's been a tendency to pump out undergraduates into the marketplace to be job ready, as opposed to equipping at least a portion of them to become employers themselves through uh, you know, stimulating industry through new business. But I do think there's a lot of verticals and a lot of niche spaces that could be occupied based on specializations like you've alluded to. Yeah. Makeda, you've uh, been very quiet. I see you've been writing lots of notes uh, and seem engaged, unless there's a TV screen on that you're watching something. Uh, but your thoughts? Yeah, I joined a little bit later, and now I see this. I, I should have done my best to join at the top of the hour. Uh, this is a fantastic conversation. I, I work for an institution that um, has clarity in this regard. We are a proprietary institution, um, so we're for profit in the US. And for those of you who are in the US know what that means from a regulatory perspective as well. Um, so uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm just finding this conversation fascinating. So we don't have many of the barriers that are being mentioned here in terms of um, faculty culture, um, and we're fairly nimble, I think, but we do have other kinds of challenges and finding fighting uh, rather the, the whole history of what for profits have done well and not so well in the last um, you know, 10, 20 years in the United States. Yeah, great. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Makeda. Yeah, and it's it's great to have you on. And I was picking on you purposely so that you come on time next time as well. Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, um, then. <laughs> um, uh, Fola, over to you. Um, I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts. Um, I think it's been a fantastic conversation so far. Um, really sad that I was only able to join about five minutes into the um, conversation <laughs> itself. I'm sorry, I was <laughs> like, just pulling your leg. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, Valerie's thoughts, um, I found very interesting about how we can train uh, more people that have experience in, in administration or get more people that have experience in administration in actual running of institutions. And um, what struck me was that we have a slightly different model at my institution, which is very small, the African Leadership University. So um, this is a university that grew up, that grew from what um, you would call a startup setup. So you actually have more business people there at the beginning and this sort of like morphed into a university. So um, we found ourselves in positions where we were many times wondering, um, are we doing what's best for an academic institution or what's best for a business? And, um, and I mean, even till today, we find ourselves referring to the structure that we've built as an organization you know, rather than a university. And I, I mean, it's those little things that we struggle with today. Uh, but in, in trying to find a balance between the business and the university, I think uh, it's it's a very interesting conversation to have. Yeah, thank you so much for, for raising that. And I think you put it beautifully. Uh, it really is a uh, interesting perspective and it's an interesting argument to hold in balance. So. Uh, Paul, we haven't heard from you for a while. Um, know you love uh, this conversation. So anything to close off with? Uh, yeah, just, I mean, I, I think, by the way, I have another three hours. So good to go, Warren. I know you, probably, <laughs> you probably have to be somewhere. But anyway, interesting conversation. We'll carry on. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, a, a couple of reflections, um, you know, in a, in a universities were created to provide knowledge from experts who you could only get the knowledge when you were in the room. You don't need to be in the room anywhere. Content is ubiquitous. And so I mean, maybe, Stephen, this is part of the abundance. So <laughs> we have abundant content. What, what, what to, and, and in addition, given COVID, um, we have a higher rejection rate in universities uh, in the, the UC system in history. 
mm-hmm. right? So, so, so you have this ubiquitous content and you have nobody who can access the, con- the, the, the sort of space called the campus. Mm-hmm. Therein lies an enormous opportunity. We just need to think more carefully about this, a variable pricing, variable credentials, right? I mean, the level of intensity and so on. I just think that there's, there's uh, some, some opportunity here that, that, that needs experimentation because universities understand how to experiment <laughs> for mm-hmm. sure. Um, you know, I can't help but be a little bit pessimistic, Stephen, around the abundance. I, I see the abundance occurring at the top and, 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 and that only at the top. And so I, I wonder how that spread impacts those who, um, for, for, for a variety of circumstances, are less fortunate. And, yes. I, and I think, you know, th- there is something to be said around how can universities like Stanford, where I was uh, there many years advocating for um, doing the right thing, doing good and doing well. And, and I think that that social mission often gets lost in, in the notion of creating research opportunities and publish or perish and get graduate students to do that work um, at a fairly low rate v- versus actually thinking about how to sustain the operation. Um, yes. So I, 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 these are just some things that I think, you know, I'm not going to answer them here, but you know, I think they're, they're both opportunities and challenges uh, that we need to wrestle with a little bit um, and continue dialogues like this, Warren, thank you for doing it, because I think with a bunch of great minds uh, attacking this problem and talking about it, then we have an opportunity to uh, educate ourselves and, and improve the outcomes. Yeah, it's precisely that point that we do these kinds of conversations. Uh, it's a principal core belief, I, I suppose, of, of what we're trying to do in the world is to have the conversation around it. More conversation stimulates thinking. I, I leave these conversations enthralled and, and full of new ideas um, that I normally share with others. Um, and uh, very grateful for your comments there. Rob, uh, um, any, any initial uh, thoughts on Paul's comment, especially around around accessibility and uh, access to these programs. Yeah, I think Paul is right on. Uh, and, and, you know, Stephen's right. There, there's just so much, uh, there's, there's never been the kinds of opportunities that we have right now. I mean, we live in the most disruptive time ever. The real critical uh, point though, is how do you connect that to a broader group of people? And that's really creating systems that, you um, that are designed to do just that. And unfortunately, I think most of the systems we have are not designed to do that. And and sometimes it takes an act of God to move uh, these these people into a different space. But at the same time, uh, one of the blessings of the pandemic and this crisis and this disruption is it's forcing us to think differently about how we serve, who we serve, when we serve. And that's what makes this space so exciting. And it's so exciting to see people who, you know, like Paul says, we're bringing our minds together to solve very meaningful problems and uh, trying to make the world a better place. I think that is the mission of higher education. And uh, that's why it's such an exciting space to be in. It's gonna be very difficult, but that's what I love about it. I mm-hmm. like the challenge. And, I, and I, I know that's why you guys are in this is you love this. You didn't come here to, you know, <laughs> to ice skate, you came here to, you know, do something that's never been done. So I, I'm, I love being, that's why I like sticking around in these conversations. This is, mm. this stuff gives me energy. No, likewise. So Tino, um, are you applauding or do you have a, a question or both? I was, I was actually doing, I was actually doing both. Um, <laughs> uh, going to, to Rob's point there as well. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, like later on admissions and stuff, but I just found it interesting in terms of accessibility and stuff around, um, uh, because most of the institutions work on an input model, right? I mean, we're trying to get the most perfect input already. So if our, if our effect doesn't really do anything, we still have the best output, right? Which is why in admissions, we have all of these selection criteria and stuff like that which I think is interesting because sometimes the biggest impact that education can have is not necessarily on the person that's already pre-made coming in, right? Which is what we're doing in terms of our selection processes. And uh, I just found this interesting in regards to what Rob had mentioned prior as well, in regards to how do we need to look at admissions and how do we just need to think about who can benefit most from the education that we can actually provide 
which might not necessarily be the ones that we're currently admitting as they are possibly reinforcing more of a spread or a gap than actually bringing different people together in regards to capabilities and learning. So anyway, just want to make that comment. Yeah, lovely point. So any further questions, Valerie, Michaela, uh, uh, Foto, Ikeli, Ciara, uh, any, anything you would like to add? Not, not a question so much as just adding to the accessibility conversation. I mean, I think that's what we've been talking about a lot on our, our campus of trying to be more inclusive. Um, that even the admissions process, maybe we don't need to rely so heavily on specific standardized tests that I think in this country, there's a lot of debate about whether or not those are just a money making tool as it is not necessarily the best judgment of a student and it's not that we're taking away requirements, it's that we're adding more to, uh, I guess, the breadth and depth of a person that's coming into the institution and what they would yes. add to us um, as a student, as opposed to just saying, do you meet this specific merit-based criteria that has been around, you know, forever. Yes. Um, so I think it, it brings a lot of promise and it is becoming more student focused in that sense that we're not saying, okay, you have to fit this prescription of this test score and, you know, this specific thing to get in here. It's yes. what else do you have going on that you can contribute to our university? And, and I think that's, that's going to benefit in the long run, right? And opening that up to more people. Yes. So we, we cover a, a hell of a lot of terrain in these conversations, um, module three as well. We, we cover uh, a vast amount of ground. Um, and so uh, appreciating that it's a, a fairly, uh, it's the largest module that we cover in the program. So just be mindful of that. Um, but we do have our pause week coming up that will give you an opportunity to catch up on, on some of the materials. But if you, have any questions? I know uh, Rob, Paul, Stephen, always incredibly generous with their time. Uh, if we can set up another session post the uh, module, um, once people have had an opportunity to really go through the the curriculum, as it were, and to then come with some clever strategies for ways we can think about the zero to wanting. Um, as as Stephen will allude to in the material, you will you will see some radical thought provoking ideas that we put forward, uh, and very keen to get your uh, take on that post the module. So this is very much an orientation to that module, the kinds of topics that we'll be chatting about, and uh, again, just deeply respectful for of the the time. Follow Kelly, um, Michaela, thank you, Tino, for uh, being outside and going to be eaten by a some dangerous animal on the beach in Mauritius um, and everybody else that's joined the call really do appreciate it. Um, I'll let uh, Paul, Rob close off and then uh, we will bring the session to an end. Yeah, I, I don't know that this was pretty, pretty apt ending. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and for uh, encouraging this dialogue and keep it going. Yeah, I don't have much to add other than this is this is great. You guys are we're talking about the right stuff. I mean, this this kind of conversation needs to be replicated on every campus across the world. So thank you. Stephen, last remarks from you. All I can say is enjoy the module, get stuck in, and by all means, I am certainly available to answer any questions. I'll be dipping in and out of the forums and following all the work uh, with great interest and uh, yeah look forward to engaging with you over the coming week and beyond thank you ever so much uh thank you everyone for your time and that brings a wrap and i can stop recording some people can go to bed some people can have another coffee paul uh i i know you're looking forward to that and Stephen, i hope the power stays on so you can carry on doing some work there in south africa Please. um thank you that'd be great enjoy the the rest of your day thanks for joining us everyone thank, thank you. you thank you bye-bye yes. thank you